Well, thank you again to the hosts and the organizers for including the Alliance trial in this exciting program. And of course, to Dr. Zwick, Bird, and all my co-authors for allowing me to present today. These are my disclosures, including research funding. So as we just heard this morning, patients over 65 really re represent a distinct and unique population with challenges and toxicities to chemoimmunotherapy. And despite the fact that over 70% of patients with CLL are over the age of 65, historically they've been underrepresented in trials, which makes it difficult to extrapolate and determine the best standard of care for these patients. Therefore, after showing superiority to chlorampicil in the frontline setting and approval of abrutinib, this uh, randomized trial was undertaken really to address two questions in an older patient population. First, in a more relevant comparator, how do abrutinib regimens compare to bendamustine and rituximab? And then secondly, does the addition of rituximab have efficacy benefits? As a reminder, this is the study design. After central review, over 540 patients were randomized at 219 United States and Canadian centers, and they were randomized one to one to one to bendamustine rituximab, standardly given, abrutinib continuously, or abrutinib with, with rituximab, rituximab given for the first uh, six cycles, and then abrutinib monotherapy. The primary endpoint, of course, was progression-free survival. And I also like to point that there were a number of correlatives that we'll come back to, including, of course, the geriatric assessment. So the key eligibility of this frontline untreated, previously untreated older patient population is shown here. And I'll highlight, given the relevant drugs here, patients requiring warfarin or Coumadin, given the known bleeding risk of abrutinib, were excluded. And patients had to have adequate bone marrow reserves, notably a platelet count over 30,000 untransfused, and had to have a creatinine clearance over 40. This is similar uh, patient characteristics that you would expect for an older patient population at the time of first treatment. Um, I'll point out here that unmethylated ZAP70 was used as central uh, stratification criteria, and so it's equal across group, with the unmethylated corresponding to ZAP70 expression, which is considered an adverse prognostic marker. Centrally, again, for a frontline treated study, the patient population had 6 to 8% of patients with deletion 17P and almost 10% of patients with TP53 mutation. Almost all patients, almost 500, also had complex karyotype performed, and I'll come back to talk about that later. That was found in almost 25 to 30% of patients. Almost three quarters of patients completed the geriatric assessment. As Dr. Good pointed out, this provides a lot of details, although most patients had high preserved function and there was no difference between the groups. So this is the primary endpoint of the progression-free survival previously presented, showing superiority of both abrutinib regimens compared to bendamustine rituximab with hazard ratios shown here. And the median progression-free survival was only reached in the BR arm. Importantly, too, as you'll see, there was no difference in the progression-free survival between the abrutinib and the abrutinib rituximab arm. And again, we'll come back to discuss later in the relevance, at least, of the addition of rituximab to abrutinib in this older patient population. I now just want to go through some of the reported uh, subgroup analysis, notably first, um, the performance of FISH and highlighting the patients with deletion 17P, again, 6 to 7% of patients. And just as a reminder in what we heard this morning, to put in perspective of how patients on the abrutinib regimens did in the presence of deletion 17P, just the reminder of the availability of these agents compared to chemoimmunotherapy when with uh, bendamustine, rituximab, and other studies, patients similarly only had a progression-free survival of about eight months. And then again, in the frontline setting, one other point to highlight is while the follow-up on the study right now is 38 months, there's a smaller uh, frontline cohort of TP53 aberrated patients showing that this might be preserved with almost three quarters of patients at five years of follow-up in this setting uh, still remaining progression-free and 85% uh, overall survival.
The other part, though, from this study I want to highlight is the role of complex karyotype. Again, this was a frontline study, and almost 500 of the patients had complex karyotype or karyotype tested. So we have the availability to look at the prognostic significance of complex karyotype in this population. And what was interesting and found and shown the 24-month uh, progression-free survival estimates here is for the abrutinib-treated patients, there really was no difference in patients with complex karyotype. Karyotype. Again, this is somewhat in contrast to other studies that have shown complex karyotype, even in abrutinib-treated patients, as an adverse marker. Susan O'Brien and colleagues reported in five-year follow-up data, again, of abrutinib-treated patients, and similarly saw that in patients without deletion 17P but with complex karyotype, they still had preserved progression-free and overall survival, suggesting that there are likely markers, especially 17P, within this complex karyotype group that are very important. The second subgroup analysis for me that I want to highlight, of course, is the role of the IGHV mutation status. This was not required in the study, but over 360 patients had it tested. And again, just putting in historical perspective the role, because in the era of chemoimmunotherapy, even for patients that achieve undetectable MRD with chemoimmunotherapy, FCR, most of those patients with unmutated IGHV will eventually progress. In contrast, what we're seeing with abrutinib is there doesn't appear to be an interaction of abrutinib uh, with the mutational status. However, again, in this trial, patients were uh, stratified according to the ZAP70 methylation status. Um, and for those patients with considered the favorable methylated status, there was no significant difference um, in the progression-free survival of that favorable risk group, suggesting again, like uh, what Dr. Shanafelt just presented that these patients may still have long benefit from chemoimmunotherapy. In secondary analysis, at current follow-up of 38 months, as mentioned, there was no difference in overall survival, with median overall survival, of course, not reached, and 90 to 95% in all groups. These are the responses. Notably, in this trial, over 90% of patients had CT scans along with physical exam to determine responses. And as you see, overall response rates were higher in their brutinib regimens compared to bendamustine rituximab. But complete response and MRD was higher in the bendamustine rituximab group. I will point out that at least two other studies and follow-up indicates that likely with longer follow-up for patients that are able to remain on a brutinib, we'll see some of these CR rates increase. And then lastly, we'll summarize the adverse events seen and presented previously on this trial. Given abrutinib regimens have been summarized of all grades before, this study focused on grades three to five adverse events. And as you can see, any hematologic adverse event of grade three or higher was higher with the BR arm. However, non-hematologic grade three to five adverse events were higher on the um, abrutinib-containing regimens. And then lastly broke down, because the follow-up was longer on the continuous abrutinib, the unwitnessed um, or unexplained cause of death, but then it was also looked at within two distinct subgroups, those within 30 days post-treatment, and then within the six cycles to better give an equal report of time, but still some um, more um, unwitnessed death observed in the abrutinib arms. And then lastly, I'm pointing with this, I think, is whether patients are able to maintain on therapy. And in this older group of patients, you'll see for bendamustine and rituximab, almost half of patients still in remission, but about two-thirds of patients are still remaining on abrutinib. So in conclusion, in the primary endpoint, abrutinib regimens significantly prolong PFS, but there is no difference in the addition of rituximab to abrutinib monotherapy. And so the last point that I'll end with here is in noting the non-hematologic toxicity is higher in this group, and is specifically higher compared to the younger patient population. I think this brings attention to continued need for trials, including the cooperative trials I mentioned here, and a nice segue into tonight when we'll see some posters and have other discussions regarding how we better understand the role of age, comorbidity scores, and functional status in older patients. Thank you very much. We'll take uh, one question or two. Start in the back. Hello, Panagiotis Balakas, Uppsala University here. Uh, may I ask you regarding the cases with complex karyotype, did you see any difference with those carrying high complexity, meaning more than five aberrations than those just having more than three? 
So I think that's an excellent question. To answer straightforward your question, I don't have that answer in terms of the degree of complexity, but I think your question just brings up in general, how do we further dissect complex karyotype, because it's certainly not an equal patient population. Peter? Daniel, thanks for the great presentation. So you raise a, uh, an issue which I think we're, we're struggling with in our trials where we're comparing a, a long-term therapy, continuous therapy against a, a defined duration of treatment and the, on our reporting of SAEs and certainly deaths uh, makes an imbalance and you tried to balance it by showing the six-month data for sudden deaths, I guess. Do you have data for the BR arm after the 30 days and report the sudden deaths in that period. So that, that's probably a, a, a more equivalent uh, comparison. So excellent point. I don't have that data, but I think it just brings to um, what we're hoping to follow up on in general, which is further dissecting out the causes of death. Um, on both arms, the BR and the abrutinib in the continuous therapy, there were up to seven on um, those two arms of uh, deaths attributed to CLL or Richter's, and Richter's was pretty low between the arms. And like we talked before with the availability of other agents in a frontline study, why so many deaths were attributed to CLL progression versus potentially other causes of death, I think is very important. It's probably something we need to address in the next guidelines, how we actually report A's in, in, in those sorts of trials. Yes. Uh, Dr. Rai. A, a quick question which has remained undiscussed at this meeting, and uh, I want to ask, you do not mention any comparison between I versus IR, and uh, your prospective planned study did not require that comparison. But your observations bring up something that Tate Schoenfeld's study, which did not have a I alone arm, so that we could not compare. More than murmurs have been raised as to whether there is a beneficial role of adding anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody to ibrutinib. So I think from this study, and it was a planned third analysis to compare the abrutinib plus, to the abrutinib plus rituximab arm, and with no PFS difference between the two, I think at least in the question of abrutinib as the BTK inhibitor and rituximab as the anti-CD20, that there is no role for the addition generally for patients. Of course, we have patients with complex situations of past autoimmune conditions, et cetera. Um, but I would favor, based on the no PFS difference of at least with rituximab and abrutinib, no benefit to the addition of rituximab. I think we also have to not assume that not only is there not a PFS difference, but also remember that adding rituximab to abrutinib is not necessarily in every patient benign, both in cost, risk of neutropenia, or other toxicity. So when I take the two sides of the coin together, the lack of PFS, as well as the fact that you have to consider some toxicity risk and inconvenience and potentially cost to the patient, I would not favor in most patients adding rituximab to abrutinib. Thank you.